righty. Come on in. My light's green. Is it working? I said green light. You got green over there. There we go. Now we're working. Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful Sunday. It is a gorgeous Sunday. Uh, the, uh, these are the days that you do not like daylight savings time, to be honest with you. I just wish they would just pick something and stick with it. But that's okay. So we have been gone from you guys the last couple of weeks. I don't know if you noticed that or not, that you've had guest speakers the last couple of Sundays. Somebody told me it's good to have a good speaker for a change. Appreciate that. But anyway, we, we were down in uh, Curtis last Sunday, Curtis, Nebraska. My uh, sister is married to a pastor down in Curtis at the Brian Church. And the church was throwing her a surprise 50th birthday party. And she had no clue any of this was happening. So their elders was kind of working through through my brother-in-law and our elders, they all kind of all said, yep, you can go down there and you can preach to kind of do something for your sister and so all the family can come in. And we had a great Sunday. It was a glorious time. So thank you so much for praying for us down there. We had a wonderful time getting together with family and I have, there's seven kids in my family and six of us were able to be there. We had fun. It was really good. Enjoyed it a lot. But it is good to be with you guys again. It's going to be a great Sunday. So we're glad you guys are here. My allergies kicked in yesterday with a vengeance. I don't know how many of you guys are facing this. I don't get them very often. Uh, it's kind of a short little thing, but the timing was not the best. So I took some stuff this morning, which can make me more bobbleheadish than normal. Okay? So be afraid. Be very afraid. It's going to be a fun one. In fact, um, Eden's fiance was here this weekend, and he made comment he had never seen me like this before. Some of that was a lack of sleep, but there was, yeah, it was a great time. We had fun in our house. For those praying for Eden this week, we appreciate that. We, uh, we had three ER trips this week um, for some stuff that she was going through, but we finally got it all figured out, and today we're as normal as we were before, right? You're not as normal as you were before. You're almost as normal as you were before. Sure, okay. Better. Better is a good word, so we're doing better today. So thank you guys for your prayers for that. Barb, it is good to see you today. Thank you for being here. For those who may not know, Barb lost her husband this last week. And so if you, you just have time, go give Barb a hug after church today. Tell her you're praying for her. I know she'd appreciate that very, very much. I know that she would. So Junior Riesland is doing fairly well. Um, just so you guys know, went saw him last week, and he's doing pretty good. As Luke and JC, I don't see them here today. I'm sorry? It's Gabriel's birthday. I'm just seeing how Breck is doing. He's in recovery. Okay. So they have a one-year-old, well, it's a yeah, one-year-old friend, Breck, who had some surgery, and he's doing, he's doing better. So keep praying for him. We'd appreciate that. There, guys, it's kind of a busy week. There's a few things going on this week we want you all to be aware of. Um, today is, of course, Communion Sunday. And so we'll be at, it's here in just a few minutes, we'll be taking communion together as a church family. And just so that you guys know, as a reminder, we are a church where we believe in what's called open communion. Meaning if you're a believer in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, we'd invite you to take that with us then at that point. Um, if you are uncertain about that, we would ask that you would uh, respect our own beliefs and withhold from taking with us today. Um, but that'll be communion and then... Part of what we do on Communion Sundays is we take a benevolence offering as well. And so after the service, not, not during the regular offering, after the service, and then they'll be standing at the back over in each side, and they'll be taking, collecting offering for the benevolent needs of the people in our church. So be aware of that. There's a women's Bible study that began this Tuesday, and ladies, you can jump right in. It was just the first week, kind of an introduction thing. That's this Tuesday. And it's, it's a great study on Nahum. That's one that a lot of people say, man, we're doing a sermon on Nahum, and everybody gets excited, right? Actually... If you're like me, sometimes you, you grow up and thinking, is there even a book called Nahum, right? I've never even heard of this thing. If I hadn't been for Awana, I wouldn't have known what it was, okay? Because I never heard a pastor preach from Nahum. I don't ever remember a single sermon from Nahum in all my years growing up, right? So what in the world is Nahum? Well, ladies, we would encourage you to be part of this. The books are 16, but you don't have to have a book to attend. You can talk to Rachel about it. It's just a short six-week study, a book on Nahum, a study on Nahum, which would be really good. And it, it's just talking about how God understands our pain. And if you watch The Prince's Bride, you know life is pain. Anyone who tells you otherwise is trying to sell you something, right? So come, be part of that, be part of the fellowship there. I know you guys would really enjoy it. That's Tuesday evenings at 7 here at the church, kind of in the back conference room over there. 
Our monthly potluck is next week, so come and be ready to, well, to eat some great food together. It'll be a great time. We are beginning our Faith Promise Pledge Drive. We've already begun it. What that is here at Grace Church is that we take time um, in the spring, when, before setting our budget for the annual, for the next fiscal year beginning in April, we take time to ask our church family, to ask you as individuals, to consider how you as a family could support missionaries. So above and beyond your normal offering, you think, here's how much I could give each month or I could give on an annual basis to a missionary or to, to the missions of Grace Church. And then we'd ask you to write that number down on an envelope and then turn that in either in the offering or you can put it, I think, in Lura Townsend's mailbox. You can do that uh, where you can say, okay, we're going we're gonna to give this much every month. And from that comes our budget to support missionaries. Missionaries that we support are, are fully funded through the giving of people like us. And so if our giving goes down, or if our support goes down, so does their support. And so it's one of those things we're hoping that we can keep our same level as where we are right now with them. But we want you guys to consider, man, we, could, we, we may be able to do that. We may be able to give you know, $10 a month, or $100 a year, or $50 a year, or something like that. Just consider how you as a family could give to the Faith Promise Program here at Grace. And then if you need... If you don't have a mailbox or you've lost your letter or something like that, let me know and we'll get one to you so that you guys can support our, our missionaries who are out doing, I mean, they're, they're trying to spread the gospel as well. Some are local, some are Awana missionaries are local, some are overseas, and they all need support in order to continue doing what they do. So can, just prayerfully consider that. That'll be ending in March. You have just a couple weeks here to think about that. The budget committee is going to be meeting this here in a couple weeks, we're going to be meeting together, so do pray for them as we think about our next fiscal year. The Grand Prix is coming up. Yesterday, we had a pit day over at Mel Fuller's. We had a couple, few people show up and needed help building their cars. We had a great time with that. But Grand Prix is coming on March 20. You don't have to race to come and watch. It's always fun to come and watch the kids race their cars. So if you guys want to come on March 20, Wednesday night, be here for that. We just appreciate you. Yeah, that would be fun. You guys can come. There'll be some light refreshments. So enjoy that. But then the following Sunday, on March 24, we're having our Awana Sunday, where the kids are going to be part of the service. We're inviting the parents to come, and we're going to have the kids be part of our worship service, sing some songs with us. And so we invite you guys to, again, think about that. And then for the guests, right, treat them well and, and be friendly. And I think it's going to be a good time as we, as we worship together with our Awana kids. And uh, last week, we had Philip Chase from Homeward Trail was here. It is time to register. It was kind of a reminder last week, hopefully. But it is time to register your kids for summer camp if you guys want to do that as well. All right, there's something we wanted to talk about here before we go into the prayer, and that is talking about the missionaries that we're supporting. We're going to be learning today, just briefly. Okay. So the Homeward Trail flyers we have out here in the slat wall, we asked Philip to bring some. And they did not have any prepared yet. So the Homeward Trail flyers we have on the slat walls are not the right dates. So to find the right dates, we'll have to go online to do that. I think it's homewardtrail.org. Um, is that right, Kayla, homewardtrail.org? No idea? Okay. That's your brother's problem, right? It's your brother's problem. Let him deal with it. I'm sorry? It's in the bulletin. So you guys can look that up. All right. Man, I already feel these antihistamines are killing me today. All right. Where are we? Weiss's. Thank you. There we are. Alex, do we have something pulled up? Here we go. Meet Alvin and Sharon Weiss. Alvin and Sharon were missionaries down in Mexico for years. They were down there serving in Mexico. And, okay, this thing advances on its own. That's, okay. Can we turn off the advancement there, Sunshine? Because I can talk fast, but I'm not sure I can talk. I mean, we could try this. We'll try it. Pull it back up. He's going to try to turn off the advance on whatever, the timings. Just turn off the timings, maybe. We'll see what we can do here. It's beautiful flowers. I did not take a picture of those. Here we go. So I want to share, and right now, they've come back from Mexico, and they're in Simpsonville, South Carolina, starting a church, a Hispanic church, okay? A Hispanic-speaking church, because that's, they're very familiar with that language. And so they have this building that they're using right now. A church that's already down there is letting them meet in the afternoons for their services, and they're doing a church plant in a large Hispanic community, trying to get this thing off the ground. They started it just a few months ago. For any of you who've done church planting or, been, or have friends who've done it, you know it can be a very difficult and challenging thing. And so they're, they're well, they're, they have weeks of encouragement and they have weeks of discouragement because sometimes you have, you'll have several people show up, you'll have 30 people show up, some weeks you have six people show up. And that's just kind of the nature of what they're doing. So continue keeping them in prayer. Their first service was August 6, 2023. Here's a picture of Alvin up there getting ready to preach God's word for them, getting ready to start the service. 
And then we had, you can see just a few people. The church actually grew from this number for a couple weeks. And then there were some people that quit coming and some have come back. They had a Christmas Eve service that went very well for them. They had a, a pretty good crowd there uh, where they had a Christmas Eve gathering. And then afterwards they ate a meal together and they enjoyed that time of fellowship. It was really good for them. But you can pray for Alvin and Sharon. There's a need for Hispanic-speaking churches in the U.S., especially in the U.S. We have that need in Grand Island as well. So you can continue to pray for them. But we are supporting them and what they're doing down there. And we're praying that God will continue to, to send people to them. And that's their prayer as well. And so you can pray for them also as they continue their, their endeavors down there in South Carolina. Yes, dear. That's correct. Okay. So Alvin and Sharon, and Sharon, I know, especially has some health issues, and so you can pray for their health. Um, they are, you know, as we understand, as we age a little bit, things get a little bit more challenging. Um, so you can just keep praying for them and their health also. All right, so just a brief update on Alvin and Sharon. We're going to go ahead and go to prayer and have the collect the morning's offering after that. And understand, just as a reminder, we try to communicate this every week, but of course, offerings, our offerings to God is an act of worship. It's not something that's required here at Grace Church. We have no expectation we're not going to come knock on your door. We're not going to send you a letter saying you must give X amount of dollars. It's just something that we would encourage you to do as an act of worship to God. So understand that uh, as we collect them offering today, and then you give as God leads you. God, we thank you for our service together this morning. God, we're going to ask you to be with me here even today as, as right now I'm just even tracking my thoughts. Lord, you're going to have to help me today. We pray for Eric and Lur, who are, they're gone, they went on a quick trip, they're supposed to be coming back today, flying back from Ireland, I pray you give them safety as they're returning home, pray you watch over them, we pray for those who are not able to be with us today, that, um, that you just be with them, help them to enjoy their, their Sunday as well. But God, here we are, our Grace Church congregation, Lord, today I pray we'd have fun together, I pray we'd have fun worshiping you. I pray we'd be reminded today of your goodness, of your love for us, the sacrifice you made for us, of salvation that you made available to us. God, I pray you help us remember this. We think of those who are serving like Alvin and Sharon Weiss. We pray for them today as they're meeting. We pray that today's service would be encouraging to them. Lord, help them and, and keep their health well and help them as they too are looking for extra support. God, I pray that you would just support them financially like they need. We think of our sister church over in Stromsburg and their Easter services that they're planning and, and other churches as well. We pray that you would bless their efforts in that. God, we, we pray so much just for Barb and her family, the loss that they faced. Lord, please be with them. Please just help them as they deal with this new reality. Um, Lord, we thank you for hope, for the praise we had and even the burial yesterday where we were just reminded of the hope we have for those who believe in you, the hope of the resurrection. We thank you for that. We think of Ed, Ed McNeff, and Lord, we pray for his mental health, that you continue to be with him and Junior and his physical health, and Gordy Christensen healing from that fall that he took, and Breck healing from the surgery, and God, we thank you that Eden is doing better today. Lord, there's just many things happening in our church family. We pray you meet these needs. Bless the offering today, Lord. May it be used for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I lift your name. 
But it's good to sing God's praises together, to worship as his people. It's lovely to hear your voices, and God delights in your praise, in your offering this morning. I want to share a thought with you that I've been thinking a lot about this week. It's just been such a wonderful thought, and I'm excited to share it with you. What if, what if in heaven, when Jesus laughs, it reverberates and it sends out shockwaves throughout the whole kingdom of God. And as his people, we get to feel, we get to literally feel the radiation of, of God's laughter and his joy. Can you imagine how incredible that would be? Oh my goodness. To see his smile, to see him laugh. Oh my goodness. It makes this day just like, yes, I want to get there. I want to do that. We have hope for today. I stand in awe and amazed at how much God loves us because he wants us to be there to experience that. He wants us to experience his love and his joy and his laughter for all eternity. And he's paid the price for that. So we stand here today amazed and in awe of what God has done for us and that he desires us to be in his presence for all eternity, that he would sing over us, that he would laugh with us, and that he would smile upon us. What lovely, beautiful thoughts that give us hope for this day to live in that. So we're going to sing and we're going to prepare for communion with those thoughts that we're just in awe of God's love for us. So please sing with us, my Savior's love. John chapter 1, John the Baptist, speaking of something he saw in verse 32, John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Today we're taking communion together. 
And as John described the Holy Spirit descending, he said he descended like a dove. He uses that, that symbolism of a dove, something that we can identify with as, as that example of what it was like. The communion table is much like that for us. It uses the symbols of the bread broken, symbols of the juice that we have here today, Christ's blood shed for us, but it doesn't change what it actually represents, which is something very real. Christ did come to this earth. He did allow his body to be broken for us. He did allow his blood to be shed for us. This is a symbol, much like what John saw. And while we take this on a monthly basis, and I know sometimes it can lose a little bit of its meaning when you do something repeatedly, I would encourage us to actually remember it for what it is, a symbol of the greatest sacrifice ever made for all of mankind. Today, if you are a believer in Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, we would invite you to join us as we are reminded through the taking of the Lord's table of his death the sacrifice he made, and what it means for us today. I'm going to ask the men to come forward at this time. Our elders are going to come. As they hand out the elements, we're going to ask that you would hold them until all have been served, and then I'll read a scripture passage, and we'll do a prayer together, and then we will eat together. First Corinthians chapter 11, read these words. I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. When he given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together.
continues writing the words. And the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we cannot thank you enough for this gift. And I, I know there are times that we, we forget the, the power of it. We forget what it means. And, and Lord, honestly, there's probably days that we, we don't even really think about the salvation you've offered to us. But in these moments, I pray that we would just once again turn our focus to the fact that we live today with hope. We live today with great hope because of what your son did for us. And today we take of the Lord's table, celebrating that, praising you for it, worshiping you for it, and proclaiming his return. Lord, we, we know that's coming. And so, Lord, we wait. We wait anxiously. God, help us to serve you and worship you well until that moment comes. But thanks again for this reminder today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink together. Just place the cups underneath the chairs. We'll pick them up after the service is over. There's an outline you can follow along with for today's message there in your, in your bulletin. You'll look and say, man, there's a lot of blanks in that thing. And there is, but it goes quickly. So we're going to get through this today. We're, in, we're still in the first chapter of John. But today, I think, is going to be a challenge for us as we, we shift a little bit in our focus. We've been talking about John the Baptist. In fact, Alex, you'll pull my sermon up for me here, buddy. Let's get that thing up and running so that we can see where we are. The, the title is, Do You Remember When? Many of us remember that moment when we first realized that God is real, that moment when we understood that Christ died for us, that moment when we asked God to forgive us. Many of us remember that. Some of us may not. You think, man, I just, I don't know that I've never not believed. I just always knew that Jesus came to this earth. He died on the cross and he rose again. And I believe that. And I, I always have believed that. But for, the, for those, excuse me, for some of us, there is that moment. And so today we're going to be talking about those moments. Good or bad, some memories stick with us. Today's sermon will study an account written by the Apostle John about two specific days that stood out in the memory of some of Christ's disciples and how the conversation and decisions of these two days are similar to what many of us experience even today. These conversations, these decisions, some of us may look back on our own lives and say, oh yeah, I remember when. I remember when I had a conversation like that. Today we're having that discussion just out of the book of John. In our last sermon that we did just a couple weeks ago, we talked about how John the Baptist, he testified about Jesus, and we, we did that passage that I just got done reading. John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and I have seen and, bore, and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist giving his testimony and the Apostle John recording that for us. This testimony that John the Baptist had. John admitted, I did not know him at first, but he is why I do what I do. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know how true that is for some of us as well. I mean, if you, if you were to sit back and flash back in your life, you know, 20 years, 50 years, or maybe for some of us just even five years, how many of us would think, man, I can't believe I'm doing what I'm doing today. I can't believe what I'm doing to serve God today. I mean, there are people I know who are Sunday school teachers, people I know who are serving in positions at church who think, I never thought I'd be doing this. I never imagined I'd be doing what I'm doing today, and yet here I am. And why am I here? Because of what Jesus did for me. I didn't know him at first, but he's why I do what I do. Some of us are just like John the Baptist. Here I am. How, how did this even happen? I don't know. But here I am. We have a very similar story. But in today's sermon, the Apostle John, he shifts his narrative from John the Baptist, and he begins to describe several encounters others had with the Messiah. 
He shifts the narrative to begin including others as well. I'm going to be talking about this as we roll through these encounters with Jesus. There are six encounters we're going to talk about today. The first encounter we find, the book of John, chapter 1, verse 35, verses 35 through 37. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. So John the Baptist had some disciples, okay, some people that he was mentoring. He looked at Jesus as he walked by and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. So this first encounter, in summary, we don't really know. We know one of the disciples here was Andrew. We don't know who the second one was. There's some hypothesis that it is actually John, the Apostle John. That's that second disciple. I'm content with that. But there's no way for us to know for certain who the second disciple was here. But there are two of John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples. And John the Baptist standing there, he sees Jesus walking by and says, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples of which John the Baptist heard that and they followed him. So what do we have here? Well, in brief, we have this. Truth is declared. Behold the Lamb of God. The truth is declared. There is God. God is here. God is right there, right in front of us. The truth was declared. And what did the two disciples do? They made a decision and they followed him. They followed Jesus. John the Baptist said, God's here. He's right there. And those two disciples, they followed him. That was the first encounter that we see. This very first encounter. The Apostle John then rolls into a second one. The second encounter he lists. This is when those two disciples actually talked to Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. They stayed with him that day for it was about the tenth hour. There's a little bit of discussion on what the tenth hour was. Most people think late afternoon, around four o'clock, somewhere around in there. But later in the day, the disciples went. But here's this encounter. First was they, they visually saw Jesus, and now they're actually talking to Jesus. So they experienced God from a distance, so to speak, and now they're experiencing God up close. Here's what we have. A question is asked. What are you seeking? What are you looking for? We might be able to relate to that ourselves. What are you looking for in life? What are you looking for? And I kind of paraphrase this next one because it made sense to me a little bit, and I'll explain to you why. This, an answer is given. Well, we want to know how to find you. Because how many times do we get together with people and we're like, man, hey, let's get together, let's talk, let's whatever. What do we do? We exchange addresses, don't we? Email address, phone number. We want some way to contact you. Well, obviously, they didn't have email back in Jesus' day. I know that may surprise you, but it's not. It's, it's not a stretch to say they did not have email. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have those things. So if you wanted to find somebody, you had to what? You got to know where they live. They were looking for that. We want to know how to find you. That's my opinion. I understand that. And so I'm just expressing it to you, but my opinion, paraphrasing it, is they, when they asked a question, where are you staying? They were really asking, we want to know how to find you. We want to know where you are. Where are you in all of this? And then, of course, he, had, he gave them a challenge. He said, hey, come and see. Come and find out. You want to know? Come with me. And again, a decision is made. They went. John records that they went. That's the second encounter. All right, moving on to the third encounter. Here we go. This is John chapter 1, beginning in verses 40 and 42. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus with Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. All right. We have the third encounter. What happens here? The truth is declared. We found the Messiah. We found him. For some of us, how, do you remember that moment when you first found God? For some, that was just was an incredible moment. That time when you first found him and then you couldn't wait to tell somebody else, hey, I found God. This is Andrew saying, I found God. He's here. So we had John the Baptist that said that very same thing. God, God is right there in front of us. And now Andrew's saying to his brother, I found him. I found God. And so an implied invitation is given, right? It's implied because Peter goes with him. Decision made. He brought him to Jesus. Andrew took Peter with him. And what happens then? A life change was experienced. 
Peter had a life change. You shall be called Cephas. You shall be, if I can say this, different. Something will be different about you. Don't encounters with Jesus do that to us sometimes? Something different happens within us. This third encounter that happens. Moving on to the fourth encounter. You guys look at this. Man, you're flying through this. I told you I was. Here we go. Moving on. The fourth encounter. Verses 43 and 44. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. What's this encounter? What happens here? So this one, Jesus made a decision. He made a decision. Jesus made a decision. He decided to go. So Jesus is the one who went. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He gave a challenge. Follow me. What did he, he gave a challenge. Follow me. We don't see in the text that Philip right away followed him. But what we do see is this. The next one, the fifth encounter that we see here, we have this happens. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. So we have this encounter, this other encounter where, where Jesus came to him, right? He came to Philip. We already talked about that. He came to Philip and said, hey, follow me. And Philip, what does he do? Well, he goes to find his brother. He goes to find Nathaniel. I said brother. This text doesn't actually say that, so I apologize. But he went and found Nathaniel. And it, again, truth is declared. We found Jesus. We found the Messiah. We found God. Once again, the same message. We found God. We found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And of course, now we have a little skepticism, right? But the response is given. Can anything good come from, right? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? We have... We have communities we think of much the same way. You know, I lived in Omaha for 15 years. And the people on the west side of the river viewed people on the east side of the river a little bit differently, right? I mean, you had Council Tucky is what we called it, okay? Which, being from Iowa, you know, it was, I mean, they called it the armpit of Iowa sometimes, right? I mean, that was what Council Bluffs was considered, okay? You have those communities that you just look down upon. Nazareth was one of those. And so the thing of skepticism, can anything good come from Nazareth? What if he didn't argue with him? He didn't try to, to make it make sense. He said, hey, just come and find out yourself. Right? Can anything good come? Challenge the issue. Come and see. He's not there to debate the issue. He's just there to invite him to come and be part of it. Come, Hey, come and look for yourself. Make your own decision. I can't prove to you one way or another. You've got to decide. Come and see. This, of course, leads to the sixth encounter, which we find in John chapter 1, verses 47 through 49. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. So in this encounter, what do we have? Well, the truth is declared. Where God says... To Nathaniel, I know who you are. How terrifying would that be if God said to you, I know who you are? And he meant not just who you are as a person, but he meant everything you are inside as a person. He doesn't just know your name. He knows really inside who you are. God does know the real us. He declared to Nathaniel, I know you. I know who you are. I know all that you are. Not just who you are, I know all that you are. And then he answered, well, how do you know me? How do you know me? How how do you know all of this? I saw you before. I knew you before, Jesus says. I saw you before. When you were still under the fig tree, I saw you. And at that moment, the believers declared, you really are God. 
You are the Son of God. It's interesting, we're going to see here that conversation continues. Let's read verse 49 again. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. In verse 50, Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So what do we have here? Well, we have, this is what we have. We have hope is given. You haven't seen anything yet. There is more to come than this. There is a lot more to come than what you've seen. That's that hope given in the sixth encounter. Let's break these down a little bit. Let's talk about these encounters. What do we see here? Well, faith interactions can be different. As I thought about this, and I thought about the conversations that was going on with the disciples, from disciple to disciple, and Jesus to disciples, and brother to brother, and all these things that happen. But you know what? Faith interactions can be different. Spiritual conversations can be different. Sometimes it's a question. What are you looking for in life? Sometimes we get to ask that. What are you looking for? What is it you're trying to do? What are you trying to get ahead of? What's your goals? Where do you want to be when you grow up? Where do you want to be when you die? What are you looking for? Sometimes a declaration, look what I found. Man, look what I found. Look what I've got in my life. I mean, this is amazing. People ask, well, how do you, how do you manage to get through these, this hard time with joy? Well, look what I found. It's because of what's in me, right? These declarations. These faith conversations can be different. I don't know if you've ever had one or not, but I'm just challenging you. Say, hey, look, if you ever have one, it, it could be one of these questions right here. Somebody you know, and you just ask them, hey, what are you looking for in life? Or sometimes it's, man, I can't believe what I found. Sometimes it's an assurance, he knows you. I mean, I've had conversations with people, as a man, if God knew who I was, or if you knew who I was, you'd never invite me into your church. God already knows who you are. But it doesn't matter whether you're inside the church or outside the church building, God already knows who you are. You're not fooling him. I use the word assurance. I'm not sure. Sometimes assurance is the right word. Sometimes there may be some, well, for some of us, some, some shame in there as we think about it. Maybe for all of us. It should be for all of us. All of us have got brokenness in our lives. The whole concept of, holy cow, God, you know me. That's, that's embarrassing. God, yeah, I know you. I still love you. Charles Swindoll says this, small expectations arouse a weak response Great expectations inspire heroic action because here's what we have. These interactions that we have with people, there should be a challenge. A challenge much like John the Baptist and Jesus and some of the disciples gave. The responses can be different. So the responses we get from people can be different as well. Some say, I'm in. I, I get that. It makes sense to me, right? Others say, well, how do you know? How do you know? Prove it to me. I've been in that neck of the woods, Nathaniel said. How can anything good come from that? Or Jesus, how do you know me? Or all these things. Sometimes we say, how do you know the Bible's true? I had lunch with somebody this week. Um, somebody had never, I've never had lunch with before. and They're not part of our church family. We sat down and we ended up talking for two hours. It was crazy. Great conversation, but some of that conversation was, well, how do you know that's true? How do you know? And, of course, another response, can anything good come from this? Is this a good idea? I don't, I don't know if there's a good idea or a bad idea. Can anything good come from St. Paul, Nebraska? Can anything good be found in a Baptist church? Is this possible? I know Baptist people, right? We have a reputation for being harsh and judgmental. Why? Because oftentimes we're harsh and judgmental, right? Can anything good come from this? What's our response in all this? Come and see. Come and see. We don't make the argument. We don't have to make the argument. What did did they say? The disciples, come and see. Come and see. Come and see. That's what we get to say to people. The effect of belief is also, also different in that moment. When we think back and remember when, what that moment was like. Some have a life changing experience. You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, a life-changing experience. My friend Bobby Fender from Omaha, who, before she was saved, was an addict, 
And after she was saved, she lost all desire for her previous addictions. It's gone. She's like, like, like a light switch flipped in her life. She never once desired it again. Not all of us have that. Some do. But over time, I think all of us will experience a life change. Not in a moment, but over time. Where we look back and think, holy cow, God, how did I get here? How am I doing what I'm doing? That's a life-changing experience. Some see great hope for the future. Their life situation hasn't changed. Nothing that they're going through has changed, and yet their perspective has changed completely, and they have hope and they have joy. That's what belief does. The reality is all of us should proclaim. Every single one of us should proclaim. The disciples did. John the Baptist, disciples, we found God. Come and see. Come and see what's happening. Warren Wiersbe says this, each person's experience is different because God uses various means to bring sinners to the Savior. The important thing is that we trust Christ and then seek to bring others to Him. That's the important thing. Your experience is going to be different from somebody else's in that moment. Growing up in life, what's the important thing? We trust and seek to bring others to Him. Interesting statistics here I want to share with you. In 2019, there was a survey that was done from unchurched people. Several thousand unchurched people they did a survey of, and they asked this question. How likely are you to attend church regularly sometime in the future? Of those that they surveyed, 33% said they were likely. These are unchurched people. 33% said they were likely to attend a church. So on their own, they were thinking, yeah, I'll probably attend a church at some point. Some of us here may identify with that. This next one is interesting to me, though, because they asked the question, well, how effective would invitations to church be through the following methods? Invite from family, invite from friends, online video, Facebook ad, all right? What's interesting to me is that, remember, 33% said they're likely to attend, but if a family member asked them, 55% of them said that'd be an effective invitation. And 51% of them said if a friend invited me, that'd be an effective invitation. So it goes from 33% who, yeah, I'm likely on my own to, to attend, but if a friend invites them, that number jumps to over 50% of unchurched people would be likely to attend. That's a crazy number. That's a recent number. This, this survey is less than five years old. This is the world in which we're living. How many of us could be Philip, who goes to Nathaniel? We found him. Come and see. I mean, this could be Andrew to Peter. We found him. Come and see. Can anything good come from this? I don't know. Come and see. Let's find out together. This is what we're in right now. Guys, all of us can be effective in what we're doing. We can change people's lives as we help people see Jesus. This next one's interesting as well. On church response, if a friend of mine really values their faith, I don't mind them talking about it. We have this idea that they don't want us to talk about it. This is, you look at that first bar up there. The black is that 45% someone agreed with that. The gray underneath it said 34% strongly agreed with that. So this is unchurched people where 79% said they at least somewhat agreed that if a friend of mine values their faith, I don't mind them talking about it. 79% of unchurched people said, if I have a friend who wants to talk about their faith, I don't mind them talking about it. 79%. In all likelihood, you have a friend who's unchurched, and if you want to talk about your faith, they're not going to mind. Guys, this is the world in which we live. We need to be aware that there are people who want to hear, who need to hear. It's our job to proclaim. It's our job to say, come and see. John chapter 4, verse 35, Jesus says these words to the disciples. Do you not say there are yet four months and comes a harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. He's talking about people here. Look at St. Paul. The fields are white for harvest. We have a message to proclaim. Today, I don't know where you are. Maybe today you have a decision to make. I've never placed my faith in Jesus before. I've never done that. Maybe today you need to do that. Recognize that God, I have sin in my life. This communion table illustrated the fact that you died and rose again from my sins. God, I'm making that decision today. Maybe you have a proclamation to make. The whole idea just terrifies you. I don't want to make a proclamation. I, I, can't, I can't do this. So just to kind of break the ice a little bit, I got a little video I want to show you. 
of a guy who's struggling to break the ice. And hopefully it'll be a little challenge for you. Go ahead, Alex. Let's kick it off. Oh, come on. That's not a foul. Yeah. Wings are ready. Hey, uh, let, me, let me ask you something real quick. Yeah. Go ahead and have a seat. Okay. Hey, um, asking for a friend. Mm -hmm. What would a person's general thought be about scheduling or doing something on, 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 a, on a Sunday? I think, uh, generally speaking, most people like their Sundays to themselves. But asking for a friend. Yeah. What if there was something special about the Sunday, generally speaking? Generally speaking, it'd have to be really special. I mean, like a, like a showstopper. Right, right, right. So what if someone was raised from the dead? I mean, would, would that be showstopper enough? What's well, bigger than being dead and then not being dead? Right. Right. Yeah. What what if said person was the son of God? Go on. And the miraculous act is through him he could save you from save your... Save you from my what? From your... Sins. Oh. Asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. Do you think a friend would like to go to something like that on a Sunday morning, if invited? Tell your friend mm. that uh, if he doesn't invite somebody to that, he's probably not really a friend. Right. Right? Right. And the Oscar goes to Meryl Streep. I love her. Sometimes we feel exactly like the second guy in that video. We're so nervous, we're breaking out in sweat, all of those things. It's just a question. It's just a statement. Come and see. There's something happening. Come and see. We found God. Come and see. I would encourage you as a church family, as you think about your unchurched friends, and we all have them, to maybe have that conversation. Come and see. God, give us a boldness. Today's text that we looked at was nothing more than invitations given over and over and over again to different people. The Apostle John recording those responses. It wasn't full of powerful theology and where we get to use big words like the Christophany emerging and all those things that happen. And, but God, today was just practical. And sometimes the most practical are the most scary for us as we sit and think about how it applies to our own lives. We can maybe identify with the result of some of the decisions that were made, how our life was changed or at least diff, you know, different in some small ways. The skepticism we may have had in that moment we came to faith in you. Lord, now we have a job to proclaim, and I pray you give us, man, give us courage. Even if we're sweating bullets, may you give us courage. Help us to be willing to issue the challenge, come and see. So that we are not the only ones in our group of friends that has that memory, remembering when, that moment. God, help us to lead others to that as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please rise. If I were you, I would have given up on me by now. I would have labeled me a lost cause, because I feel just like a lost cause. If I were you, I would have turned around and walked.
Father, we thank you for being the God who stays. We thank you for loving us regardless of who we are. We thank you that you know us. And frankly, that should terrify us a little bit. 